Hello YouTube, this is Golden Eman one here, and today I'm going to be taking you guys through my squad leadership guide. In a game like Planet Side 2, team play is very important to see victory at the end of the tunnel. Like I've said in some past videos, you're more likely to succeed as a team rather than on your own. However, with every squad, there is a squad leader who brings the team together in order to accomplish a goal. You may have watched my video on is leadership right for you, but you may still need some pointers here and there on where to start and what to do. So today I'm going to be giving you guys some tips, tricks and pieces of advice in order to start leading squads and enhance your squad leading skills. The video will be broken down into microphone setup, cert investments, class consideration, populating and managing the squad, map reading and picking targets, defending and attacking bases, moving across terrain, working in platoons, and finally learning from others. To begin with, we have the microphone setup. We all know that voice communication is key, and it is much better to speak and use your microphone rather than trying to type 100 words a minute whilst getting sniped. This is why you need to invest in the microphone, and it doesn't need to be anything too fancy, but as long as people can hear you loud and clear, then it's all good. You'll have to tweak some in-game settings as well, and to do this, press escape, click settings, then click the voice options. Play around with these settings and then see what works for you. The master receive volume controls how loudly you can hear other players, while the transmit volume controls how loudly other players can hear you. Be warned though, because the higher you set the volume, the more distorted the sound becomes. To make comms clearer in the heat of battle, raise the darken volume and this will reduce audio from dialogue, explosions and music when someone is talking on comms. Lastly, the microphone volume controls the volume of your microphone on your computer's control panel. Once you have finished tweaking, test your microphone and ask people if they can hear you loud and clear. As a little side note, you may not be able to speak to your squad or hear them at all. To fix this, simply disable voice chat wait for at least 10 seconds and then re-enable it and you should tell your squad members to do the same as well. Moving on to certain investments, there are some vital tools as a squad leader you are going to need and to view these tools, press escape, click the social icon and then open the squad certs tab. The first tool I'd advise you to unlock would be the spawn beacon as this will allow your squad members to deploy on your location. I'll then upgrade it by two levels to the third bar and this will cost you 330 certs. Next, I'll unlock the command communications channel and two rally colors. This will then cost you an additional 200 certs. Once this is all done, max out your spawn beacon and unlock the other two rally colors, and then the request reinforcement markers. In total, the whole squad leader certification line will cost you 1,630 certs, which is a lot, but take your time in unlocking them since you may want to cert into other classes and vehicles. However, if you find yourself using the squad beacon a lot, then upgrade your squad beacon more. If you use reference point a lot, then unlock the rally points and this will become very handy for terrain fights, but I'll let you know more about that later on in the video. Next up, you'll need to consider the class you'd like to play when leading squads, and my advice to you would be to play the class you're most comfortable with, but be aware with the role you'll have to carry out, as some may be more heftier than others. Just remember that as a squad leader, you still need to carry out your duties. If you're a medic, then you still need to revive people, and if you're an infiltrator, you're still going to need to provide intel and enemy movement positions. In my opinion, I'd recommend playing as a heavy assault or as a medic when leading squads, since they are the bread and butter of squads. As for maxes, they should be used by the squad leader only in difficult situations. Just remember that once you've pulled a max, you no longer have the ability to deploy a squad beacon. So now you're ready to start leading your squads, the first thing you need to do is to invite people to it. You can invite members from your outfit or online friends. Another way to do this is by queue spotting friendlies and then inviting them to your squad. Once you have at least one person in the squad, you'll need to list it in order for public players to see it on the squad browser and join it. Press escape, open the social tab and click squad. You then want to make sure you have private squad unchecked as well as only accepting friends and outfit. Give the description a neat name and if you're part of an outfit, I recommend that you check the show outfit box. 
Once this is all done, go ahead and enable recruitment. Managing the squad is just as important as populating it. A full squad is great, but if no one is responsive, then what's the point? I guarantee you that there will be times where you feel like no one is listening, but there are ways around this. The quickest way to see if people are following orders would be to do a warp gate recall and giving them a limited time to do so. For example, giving them 30 seconds to redeploy to the Indar warp gate. The players who haven't responded should be removed from the squad. You may think that this is unfair, but it's unfair for you and the other squad members who are listening to you to be surrounded by players who don't want to be part of the team. In addition to this, there are good players out there looking to join public squads that are organised and that use voice comps. The idea is to steadily filter out the players who don't want to play as a team and gradually you will fill your squad with players who do want to play as a team. This means less warp gate recalls will be necessary and there will be less time wasted. In the freelancers union, we like to also tell the squad to line up behind their squad leader. This way we know they can follow basic instructions and can identify their correct squad leader when playing in a platoon. Now there is an exception for players under batter rank 20 since they are new and may not know the basics of planet side 2. This is why you need to give them a step by step guide to redeploy and meet with the rest of the squad. Uh, battle war here I see you are batter rank 1, welcome to the game. Uh, redeploy to the warp gate to do this, press the U key, press the U key on your keyboard and select Mordus' galaxy to redeploy. Lastly, a squad full of heavies isn't going to help anyone, so you need to make sure that the squad composition is balanced. When playing in public squads, I encourage people to play the class they want. However, I make sure that we have at least 3 medics and 3 heavies. The only class I warn people about is the light assault, and this is because they usually find themselves disconnecting from the squad, so they won't be in medic revive range. But that's the risk they take. As a squad leader, you'll need to be confident with map reading and picking a target, based on the information the map gives you, as there are multiple things you'll need to consider. Different leaders like to have different map settings. The settings I have here allow me to clearly see where the battles are going on. But as you continue to squad lead, you may want to play with the settings to make the map more readable for you. Now the hotspots allow me to see where the battles are taking place, so from the map I do some investigation. The three things I look out for are bases with timers, base population and connections. Just remember that when you're trying to pick a target, consider the fact that you only have a maximum of 12 players. Either way, move to a location where you believe you can have the biggest impact on the battlefield. Here I'll take you through a thought process of what goes on in my mind when picking a target. So looking at geological survey camp, and it does seem like a good base to attack and I'll tell you why a little bit later. But it does look like a small base that we can hold, or one point to hold, not too much. We've got some good cover here for the L-shaped buildings and the point is in this location here. Now the reason why I think this will be a good base to attack on the NC front is because we have a 96 plus, uh, well yeah, a 96 plus versus 48 to 96 and we have quite a few more NC forces since they're listening and I would attack that because it will cause troops from this location, enemy soldiers from this location to uh, move into geological survey and try and defend it and this will relieve forces at Echo Valley substation. However, if I wanted to directly attack the uh, enemies on Echo Valley and Sura Listen, then I may just deploy some sort of uh, anti-vehicle nest around the mountains here to try and take out the enemy vehicles. But what I must consider is that we've got the VS on our six here, uh, Echo, sorry, uh, Isotech plant, and some on Ace Mountain Pass. The uh, VS on Ice Mountain Pass won't really bother us if we set up here, but this base here may have, I don't know, a vehicle pad or air pad and they may bombard us from aerial assault. Uh, moving along, yeah so Pale Canyon is uh, getting defended which is good and I'm gonna look up at Anvari Barracks over here so it does seem like the VS are battling inside the bilab maybe on the landing pad but what I might do is just annoy them we have 12, 1 to 12 troops here so maybe only one or two soldiers and I might just drop my squad here to uh, to contest the A point and uh, slow down the enemies on the advance towards Envari Biolab. And um, yeah, look, Madison's Triumph. Can I do much with a 12 man squad on a three point base? 
and uh, alert when there's a lot of enemies. Uh, no, not much, and that's why I would avoid uh, three point bases when you're playing as a squad. Maybe if you're in a squad in a platoon, then yes, go for it. But a squad just playing by themselves, not a good idea to go for three point bases. Every base in Planet Side 2 have their differences, as there are different base layouts, lanes you have to push up from, and different directions which the enemy could attack from. There are two main types of buildings you'll come across, and these are called the Powerhouse and the two-story slash triple stack building. So the first part of the building is the big stairs, and this is generally unsafe since you have enemies and friendlies shooting up and down it. The part that you should be on instead is the landing. We then have the small stairs and this provides great flanking opportunities so you'll need to have this area covered by maybe one or two or even possibly three squad members. But the first floor or the ground floor is a floor that you need to avoid because it comes very hard to revive people if they're down. So as we rush up the big stairs we're gonna enter the kitchen area. Now the kitchen area is where the point is generally placed and the cover does vary from base to base but the general shape of the kitchen remains the same. So the first part of the building is the stairs and you're also going to need to watch the capture point because this is the capture point that you're going to need to hold. Whereas whereas holding that room you're also going to need to hold the room without the capture point because you don't want to be flanked by the enemy. Now in addition to this we have some stairs that lead up to the roof and you also need to watch these stairs because galaxy drops, light assaults or Valkyrie drops could also flank you on the base. But if you do come out here then you need to be careful because you're exposed to air and you're also exposed to hostile vehicles that might be on the hills. Last but not least we have the balcony area and you can also again come out here to be a bit more aggressive and overlook on enemies but you have to be careful because you've got enemy vehicles that could be on the hills as well as the air. However, the layout of each base varies with different buildings being used. Some points are outdoors but may have buildings around it to overlook the capture point. Others have capture points indoors. A general rule of thumb with buildings with staircases is to never stand on them. Make sure you tell your squad to stay upstairs as here you will have the higher defensive ground within a building. As a little side note, you can set primary objectives by going up to capture points or generators, pressing Q and selecting set primary target. When attacking bases, you need to make sure you bring up some spawn options to allow your squad members as well as friendlies to deploy and support the attack. A quick way to do this would be galaxy dropping on a base or organizing an infiltrator to drop on a vehicle terminal and pull a sunderer. Don't forget to place your beacon in a safe location, somewhere where it will be difficult for enemies to reach and destroy it. If you're a light assault, then you could place the beacon on an antenna. As the leader, you need to make sure that you stay on your toes and you're alert of enemy movement. Tell your squad to inform the squad if they see hostiles moving around. If you see the chance to push up to another building or take a better offensive position, then do so quickly. However, if you do this, know that enemies could flank you and capture the point unless you have friendlies overwatching it. In my opinion, a great deal of improvisation and creativity is required when defending or attacking bases. Think about how you can surprise the enemy or hit them from an unexpected angle. Ask yourself questions, should we take a wide flank towards that building or pull some maxes to break through enemy defences? As with any assault, you need to make sure you inform and rally your squad before making a move. Always tell them what you're about to do so that you move as a team and not as individuals. In the Freelancers Union, we follow a structure called SRA, which stands for Secure, Rally and Advance. The securing part is usually the longest as it involves taking a point, taking out a generator or even securing a building, but in general it's about securing an objective that you have personally set. The next part is rally which is about gathering your squad after you've secured your objective. And lastly you advance which is moving towards your next target. You'll find that this structure repeats itself or hopping from secure to rally and back again before you advance. As well as the fighting going on within bases, it also happens between bases taking place in the terrain. Here you'll be dealing with some pockets of infantry but mainly vehicles including tanks and aircrafts. You could meet armor with armor and battle the enemy like that. 
If you would like to see an example of this, then please click on the video card in the top right corner, where I led a squad of harassers within the platoon. The other approach which I find more effective and threatening to the enemy is making mobile anti-vehicle slash air nests. This is where the squad has AV gear with Sundra support to deal with enemy vehicles. The gameplay you're seeing now is an example of this. Earlier in the video I recommended that you unlock the coloured rally smoke points and when working with the terrain, using coloured smoke is very helpful for you and your squad members. Since the smoke is coloured and attention grabbing, use the smoke to identify enemy tank clusters and inform your squad to focus fire towards that direction. A quick way to eliminate targets is to cool them out and to focus fire. I would recommend that you bring up at least two repair sundies with one deploying and the other parking up close to proxy repair it. The sundies should be close to your infantry but in cover from enemy vehicles. Once again, you need to be alert of the battlefield as the flow of battle can change very quickly. If you see enemy tanks falling back to repair, then take the opportunity to quickly move up and secure a more threatening position. However, if you need to fall back due to advancing tanks and vehicles, then do so. More importantly, do what you can do to keep the Sunders alive since you don't want to deplete your squad's nanites quickly. To give yourself cover, you could ask for a smoke screen to move across the terrain, which should increase the survivability of the squad and surprise the enemy. Terrain fights are all about patience and steady leapfrogging opportunities. If you want to have a better view of the terrain and the enemies, then you could use a 3x scope to see what's going on. Sometimes a full squad of 12 isn't enough to complete a task, as you may find yourself being overrun time and time again. This is why working in a platoon can be helpful. Finding public platoons can be hard, so this is why I recommend that you join an outfit that can provide organised public or outfit-only platoons, where you can be given the chance to squad lead. Here you'll be able to coordinate with other squad leaders in order to make sure you reach the common goal which is set by the platoon leader. If you're about to make a move to a different location, make sure you let your platoon leader know before you do so. Also, don't be afraid to directly communicate with other squad leaders if the platoon leader has given you a task. For example, if you've been given a task to capture a point in the powerhouse, then you could let the platoon know that Alpha Squad will hold the kitchen. This will cause the other squad leaders to call out what positions they'll be holding and this will avoid too much of the platoon holding one part of the building whilst the other parts are undefended. Last but not least we have learning with others and this is probably the most important piece of advice I could give you. It's good leading squads regularly but it's even better to see how other squad leaders are doing it. Think about the things they are doing well and see how you could use them in the future or even improve their tactics. I have a series on my channel called Live Leadership, where I post live gameplay of leadership, so do feel free to check it out. Once again, I recommend that you join an outfit, lead some outfit-only squads, and at the end of each session, ask them what you should do to improve. If your outfit has some sort of online form, you could create a post asking for some written leadership feedback. At times, leadership can cause a bit of stress. If you feel like you're losing the will to lead, then try to find someone to take over, or give a final debrief and disband a squad by typing forward slash squad disband. However, in my opinion, leadership can bring a new dimension of accomplishment to the game. You get to lead a group of people in order to achieve a common goal, which I find very enjoyable. But that does wrap it up for now, but if you have any other questions, then feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Also, if you have any additional tips, tricks, or feel like I've missed anything out, then why not leave them in the comments section below so we can all learn. Maybe you have some friends or outfit members which you believe will benefit from this video, so why not go out and share it with them. But I hope you have enjoyed this video, and if you have, why not smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, why not subscribe today to receive some more golden quality content. But nonetheless guys, thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys soon. Peace.